can't go with the Good morning, everyone. Pastor Colleen is going to be the guest preacher at Whitehall United Methodist Church today, and we have guests here for our services. I think that uh, the most interesting thing I found about her being there is that um, they have a service in Spanish, and she said that she would lead the service in Spanish. Now, when she told me about that, she was wondering aloud whether that was a good idea. We'll all find about, out about that later on. Our preacher is the Reverend Caleb Resendiz, who pastors at Whitehall. He's a pastor who comes with a bachelor's degree in theology from the John Wesley Methodist Seminary in Monterey, Mexico and he is currently studying for a Master of Divinity degree at Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. His wife, Alma, who is studying for a Master's degree in Social Justice at the Methodist Theological School in Delaware, and their daughter, uh, Veronica, Veronica isn't in school yet because she's one, um, are along, they are, I don't know if they're in here yet or not. They were going to be here to be seen. And we welcome you to, ah, here they are, right here, uh, <laughs> Alma and Veronica. We welcome all of you to this service, and we are pleased that you are here.
please stand for the call to worship. This day Jesus is calling to you. Lord, help us to hear you. This is a time of decision. Lord, help us to be Come, let us celebrate God's love. Let us rejoice and call our Savior. Teach us your ways, O Lord. Help us to be closer to you. The hymn is number 170. are having a responsive reading for our uh, first text today, and that is on page 824 um, in your uh, bullet, your near, uh, uh, yeah, hymnal, thank you. Sometimes they just disappear. <clears throat> in this, we will sing a response, and then... Um, alternately uh, speak the lines in this part of the psalm. Your part is in dark winds. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. and justice for all who are oppressed has made known God's ways to Moses, God's acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is the Lord is the Lord. The Lord will not always chide nor harbor anger forever. The Lord is not according to our sins. Nor as 
as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the Lord's steadfast love toward the faithful. As far as the east is from the west, so far does the Lord remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to the faithful. For the Lord knows our frame and remembers that we are dust. flourish like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. It isn't real worship without a welcome. So, let's take a little while to welcome those around us.
guys want to sit over on the bench? If the kids are not down here yet for our children's moment, you can send them down. Wonderful. Oh, there I am. I'm here. All right. So, kids, I have a question for you today. Um, have you ever been somewhere that you did not want to be at? Like what, Peter? School. All right, school. What? Uh, no, we want to. No, 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 no. We want to be in church. Um, <laughs> that's why I love kids. They're very honest. I love it. How about the dentist office? How many of you guys like being at the dentist office? No? What about the doctor's office? No? Yeah, I know you want to be a doctor, Lizzie. Well, I talk about this idea of uh, places that we don't want to go because this month in October, we're going to be studying the book of Daniel. And one thing we know about the book of Daniel is that him and some other Israelites were living in Babylon, a place that they did not want to be in. They were forced to live at Babylon, kind of like the BMV. No one really wants to be there, but we're kind of forced to go there. It's, you'll find out when you're older, Peter, what the BMV is. <laughs> it's a, but, um, but what we see in Babylon is that Daniel was able to put his trust in God and because he was able to put his trust in God, he was be able to be very influential to the citizens in Babylon, even to kings and prophets there. And he was able to show God's might and love, even being in a place that he did not want to be. So I want to read to you our memory verse for this month. It comes from the prophet Nahum, and it's Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. And this is what it says. It says, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. Do you guys know what a refuge is? It's like a safe place. It's like a place where you feel safe. So a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. So that is Nahum 1.7. So that's a verse that we're going to be learning this month. So let me go ahead and pray with you guys, and we will learn more about Daniel in our time of Sunday school. Let us pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we're just uh, so thankful for this day. We are thankful for the opportunity to... Uh, just know that you are good and that you love us and that you are with us and that we can always trust you through the ups and downs in life, Lord. And God, as we uh, study the book of Daniel this month, may the love of your son, Jesus Christ, pour into each and every one of us as we study your word. It's in all these things we pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, kids, let's go ahead and go and make our way up to Sunday school. In your bulletin is a list of joys and concerns for our prayers. Take that along, and for the rest of this week, remember, there are people there who wish to be prayed for. Pray with me. God, we're gathered here together this morning to sing and to pray and to listen and to be a community of faith and we thank you for your goodness to us in so many ways there are times when we're not always sure of things and, and we thank you for a time when we can feel your presence and experience your love in the company of your people the news of our world makes us by turns encouraged and upset we pray for the leaders of nations especially for those who have brought about warfare. We pray for the people of those nations whose lives are upset and whose prospects are very limited. Grant your peace to those who struggle. We pray for those who are living in places where life is difficult, where a hurricane has ruined houses and businesses, where its beginning and ending have cost people their homes and schools and places of work. We pray with thanks for those who undertake work and repair and remind ourselves that we should share what we can to help those whose lives are now so difficult. 
We pray for the people in this congregation and for those who are part of this morning's worship. We pray the thanksgiving for those who preach, for those who teach, for those who gather others for learning and community, for those who work with children, with young people, with those who are parents, and with those who are later in their lives. Share the good news of the gospel and make this a place of community, not only of faith, but also of welcome. We pray with thanksgiving for those who sing and play and write and speak, and for those who see that we have places that are clean and safe. We thank you, God, for the gifts you give your people. And we pray with thanksgiving for the parts all of us play in this community of faith, sharing with each other and making it a place of love and hope and caring. We ask your blessing on this worship, on this learning, on all your people here and everywhere that we may together make this church and this community a bit of heaven and the place of peace. As together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever. Amen. It is a time for offering. And as we give, let us remember that our sharing is a part of our faith.
scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. It's in page 9 on your Bibles. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. For those of you who are wondering, who is that guy reading the Bible? Um, my name is Caleb Resendiz, and I am the pastor at Whitehall United Methodist Church, one of your sister Methodist churches that is actually really close from here. Uh, and I am very happy to be in this church. I am very happy to be with all of you. And I am glad that Pastor Colleen came up with this idea of doing a pulpit exchange. Uh, she is at Whitehall uh, United Methodist Church right now preaching. And then in a half an hour, she will preach in Spanish. So that's something uh, interesting. Uh, thank you for letting your pastor uh, preach at my church. I'm sure she will be a blessing for all the people at Whitehall. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, you have a beautiful church. I particularly love the, old, the stained glass windows that you have. They tell the story of the gospel, and they are beautiful. You have a, a fantastic organ, a fantastic choir. Um, so thank, thank you for having me. And I wanted to be here to, to know you, but also to, to thank you in person. I'm in my last year of seminary. And I was struggling finding the funds for my last year's tuition. And I, so I sent a letter to the administrative board of this church explaining them my situation. And they were very gracious and loving, responding my request with, yes, we will help you. So I am, I am very glad for that, uh, very thankful for that answer. And let me tell you that that was an answer from God. So I want to thank you in person. Thank you very much for your generosity. Thank you for your generosity towards God and towards the church that made possible the administrative council to support my studies, to support my ministry. And I can assure you that I am paying attention in class, okay? <laughs> um, I'm in my last year of seminary. I'm in the process of becoming an elder of the United Methodist Church, and I am the seminary of my dreams. And none of this would have been possible without your help without the support of this church. So thank you, thank you again. Let us pray to begin the sermon. Dear Lord, you are an awesome God. You are great. You are loving. You are merciful. Lord, I pray that you will send your Holy Spirit to us gathered here in this church. Lord, we are here for you. So come, come to this church. Open our ears, open our eyes to see you, to hear what you, what you have for us this morning. And let it be you talking this morning and not me. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a one-year-old daughter. And last year, the people in my church, they did a baby shower for, for us. And we had a great time, and it was beautiful. And one of the gifts was a Jesus toy, a stuffed doll of Jesus. I actually have it here. This, is, this was one of the gifts. And when we were opening the gifts at the baby shower, one of the members of my church said, hey, it looks like Pastor Caleb. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I mean, if you look, it does look like me, right? Um, and I was so happy. And I said, yes, of course. Jesus looks like me. Um, and I was so proud about it, and I say, yes, Jesus looks like me. And you know what? Sometimes we all are like that. We want Jesus to look like us. And I am not talking physically here. 
We believe that Jesus believes what we believe, that Jesus thinks what we think, that Jesus has our moral standards, that Jesus has our, our sense of right and wrong, our understanding of Christianity. And sometimes we end up creating Jesus at our own image instead of being created at his image. So it is important to know the real Jesus, the one revealed in the Bible. And sometimes we will find out that it's somewhat different from the conception that we had about Jesus. Probably we will find out that the Jesus we see in the Bible is different from the Jesus we have been taught we're growing up or even in church. And one of the best ways to know Jesus' character and attributes is to, of course, go, go to the Bible and look at his names. Look at the titles of Jesus in the Bible, like, I am the good shepherd, or I am the bread of life. You know, those, those titles, those names of Jesus in the Bible, and when you, when you learn about those, you will, you, will, you will know Jesus. You will learn more about his character, more about who he is. And today, in today's reading, we have one of my favorite titles of Jesus. I just love how well it describes who Jesus is. The Jesus we see throughout the Bible and the Jesus we've seen throughout the centuries. The Jesus that I have personally experienced. He is the friend of sinners. That is one of the titles of Jesus. He is friend of sinners. And let me tell you that unlike the other names and titles of Jesus that we have in the Bible, this is not a title that Jesus said about himself. You know, like, I am the vine, I am the bread of life. Those are titles that Jesus said about himself. But a friend of sinners, it was actually the people that were against him, against Jesus, the ones who put this title on him. Jesus is haters. The opposition of Jesus, the people who actually ended up killing him, the religious leaders of the time. And it wasn't a good thing for them. It is a good thing for me. It is a good thing for us. But it wasn't a good thing for them back then. They actually said it, criticizing him. It was a bad labeling to diminish who Jesus was. Oh, he is a bad teacher. He is a bad person. How could that guy be God if he's hanging out with sinners? How could that guy be God if he eats and drinks with sinners? And the Pharisees were like, he is inferior from us. He's not as holy as we are. How little they knew that this title was going to be the favorite of many people. That this title was going to preach a lot about who he is. And they were right. He is a friend of sinners. So they, they, they put this title on him, but it wasn't something good for them. And you know, something similar happened to our denomination, to the Methodists. When John Wesley started, uh, when John Wesley was a student at Oxford University in the UK, he created a group with his friends, the Holy Group. And they will gather together every day to read the Bible for hours in Hebrew and Greek and to, to pray for a, for a couple hours, to visit the sick, to visit the, the people in, in prisons. And they had all this structure, an order of things to do every day. And they were very uh, strict about it. So some bullies, some of their classmates at Oxford, they started to make fun of them and mocking them. Oh, look at them. They are too methodic. Look at them. There they go, the Methodist. And it was actually to diminish them. It was a nickname to make fun of the Methodists. But it stick around. And today there's a denomination called Methodists. And a few, a few decades ago, it was one of the top three denominations in the, in the world. And uh, there were other titles like uh, Enthusiast. That was one of the titles that people used to say to, to the Methodists. Actually, a Wesleyan historian said that our denomination was this far of being called enthusiast instead of Methodist. Can you imagine? Bexley United Enthusiast Church. <laughs> How does that sound? <laughs> but now it's Methodist and it was, it's, it's, it's a great denomination. So see, sometimes the nicknames, they become a beautiful thing. That happened with the Methodists and that happened with Jesus when they said he is a friend of sinners and that became something beautiful. Now, Jesus called Matthew to be his disciple, and Matthew invited him to his house to celebrate. But he also invited all his friends. But he was a sinner, so he invited more sinners. Now, Matthew was the worst sinner in their context. His name was actually Levi, but he changed it to the Greek form Matthew so that he could do his job. He was a tax collector, a trader. Now, let me put it in context. 
because today if you think of someone that works for the IRS, it's not the worst thing. It might not be the most liked person in the country, but it's not the worst thing. So let me put it in context, what Matthew was uh, compared to today. Imagine that a foreign country comes here and overthrows the government here, and they make themselves the rulers, and they start to kill your, your friends, enslave, even rape some of your friends, and they impose an unbearable tax to you. Then you see that your neighbor, that person is working for them. And you have to pay those high taxes to your neighbor. And your neighbor, he, he charges you an extra amount for himself. And he keeps it. Then you see your neighbor buying all this fancy stuff and parking his Ferrari in front of your house. Let me ask you, would you have liked that person? Would you have been friends with that person? Me neither. But guess what? Jesus did. Jesus did. And not only that, but he loved him. And he called him by his original name. And he said, Levi, follow me. Levi, be my disciple. That was Matthew, the worst sinner in their context. And nonetheless, Jesus called him to be his friend, to be his disciple. So Jesus goes and parties with him and he drinks and eats with him and his friends, the tax collectors and the tax collectors' friends, which are more sinners. And the Pharisees, they didn't like that. Oh, look at him. He's supposed to be a religious leader. He knows the Bible. Why is he with them? Didn't we tell you that he was a false teacher? Don't listen to that guy called, called Jesus. And my friends, how much sometimes we are like the Pharisees? Judging other people and deciding who is worthy to be called Christian and who is not. Or sometimes we are Pharisees against ourselves. Sometimes Jesus has already forgiven you for the mistakes you made in the past, but you keep blaming yourself. Sometimes we keep blaming ourselves for mistakes that we did days ago, years ago, even decades ago. But let me tell you, give Jesus some credit. Accept his love. Accept his forgiveness. Accept his mercy. Go and be friends with him. If Jesus says you are forgiven, you are forgiven indeed. No matter what other people say. No matter what you think. If Jesus says you're forgiven, you are forgiven. We need to know our friend. We need to know our friend, Jesus. The one that doesn't see you by your mistakes. The one that doesn't define you by your mistakes or by your sins. The one who says to you, come to me, follow me, be my friend. I am married to my beautiful wife, Alma, and we got married five years ago. And for our honeymoon, we were at the airport right the next morning of our wedding. Um, it was not a wise decision, but we were at the airport right the next morning of our wedding and we were we checked our bags and then we brought some carry-on with us. And you know, when we're passing through the checkpoint, uh, there's this person from security, from TSA, and she said to my wife, uh, Miss, you cannot pass those liquids. You know how they don't allow you to bring a certain amount of, of liquids to the, to the checkpoint. And you have to go back or you have to throw them away. And we didn't have time, we, we were gonna lose our flight. So she had to throw, that, uh, to throw away that. And it was, she had some perfume and makeup and hair product and whatnot. And inside my head, I was thinking, oh, come on, Alma. You knew you couldn't bring that. It was the other bag. Those things are expensive. I just spent my money, all my money in the wedding. And I was thinking all of that, but it was our honeymoon. So I didn't say any of that. I didn't say anything. I said, oh, don't worry, baby, it's fine. We all make mistakes. I'll buy you more. So you know, sometimes, the, 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 I mean, the airport, the TSA, they have some instructions and some regulations that you have to follow in order to enter the terminals. And let me tell you that sometimes we see God as an airport. Sometimes we see God as TSA, as TSA. Oh, I need to say, they, to say this, I need to be this way, I need to dress, to dress this way, I need to have this before. And we start creating a checklist of things that we need to do before coming to Jesus, before seeking God, 
before pursuing a, a, a relationship with Jesus, before becoming a disciple. You know, sometimes we say, oh, I, I want to serve in church. I want to do more things in church. But I have to put some things in order before in my life. I need to have this knowledge. I need to have this time. I need to, fo to follow certain regulations before I can come to, to God. And sometimes we end up distancing ourselves from God or from the church because we have some things or some, some mistakes, some sins that make us feel unworthy. So we see God as an airport. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you, God is not an airport. God is not TSA. He is a friend of sinners. He wants to go to your house to have a meal with you, to have a conversation, to have a personal relationship with you. He doesn't see you as unworthy. He doesn't see you as incapable. He doesn't see your flaws, your mistakes, your sins. He sees you as his friend. He sees you as his beloved child. God is not an airport. You don't need anything to go to God. He's, he's waiting for you with open arms, just as you are, just as you are, with what you have. He's, he's waiting for you, ready to welcome you, just like you are. Now you might be thinking, wow, is this young pastor from Whitehall preaching about a free pass to sin? And no, no, my friends, I am not doing that. It's actually the opposite. What I'm trying to say here is that we don't need to see God or, or, or preach, about, preach from God about rules. We don't need to preach about religious instructions. We need to preach about the person of Jesus Christ. That's how we, what we need to preach. Religious rules makes you arrogant and proud, but the gospel makes you proud of Jesus. Religious rules point the finger to us, to our actions, to our deeds, but the gospel points the finger to Jesus, to Jesus' action, to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, the Bible uh, registers two occasions in which Jesus went to the house of tax collectors to eat and drink. First is the one that we read this morning uh, when he called Matthew. And he led his wrongdoings, and he changed his life. He became one of the 12 apostles. He wrote one of the four gospels that we have, the gospel of Matthew. And he was the worst sinner, but he changed. The second uh, uh, occasion that Jesus went to the house of tax collectors was with Zacchaeus in the gospel of Luke, chapter 19. And just as Matthew, this, this man invited, he invited his friends to his house and made a celebration. And then he said to Jesus, I will give five times back to all the people that I have stolen from. I will never do it again. You see, they did change. When, when, when those people had an encounter with Jesus, they changed. But it wasn't because of the law. It wasn't because of following rules, because of following religion, because of the Pharisees' speeches. They changed because of love. They changed out of love. It was the result of a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And that's what changes people, friends. That's what has changed us. That's what can change you and your friends and your community. Love. Nothing else but love. And then you and I, we choose to fight against sin. Because we don't want anything to get in our way with Jesus. Not because we have to, but because we want Jesus. Because we realize that there's nothing better than Jesus that, Jesus. that Jesus is much better. My friends, if we are still enjoying sin, it's because we haven't really met Jesus. Because Jesus is well better than anything in the world. Love changes everything. Have you seen a teenager in love? It is so entertaining, isn't it? I remember seeing my cousin... And he was always so serious, you know, rude. He didn't care about anything. You know how teenagers are. Always with an angry face and saying, don't look at me. Don't talk to me. I'm mad because I'm a teenager and life is so complicated. And they always like, and my, my cousin was like that. Oh, but when his girlfriend called him, oh, you should see him. He's like, hey, beautiful cherry pie. How are you? How's my pumpkin? 
oh, my candy necklace, I miss you. And stuff like that. I, I can't wait to see you, sugar cake, honey bombs. And <laughs> now hung, you hung up. Now you hung up, you know. And I was just looking at him. And I was surprised. And I was like, what's going on in here? Who are you? And then he hung up and he looked at me and he said, what's up? <laughs> what are you looking at? You see, huge difference. Friends, love transforms people. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is based on love. The love of God. The love of Jesus. That's why, it, that's why it transforms people. That's why it is so powerful. Because it is love. The love of God. The love that Jesus has for you and for me. If we really want to transform our community, our neighbors, our family, ourselves, we won't do it by sharing religious rules or by giving out stuff, we'll do it by sharing and showing the love of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, you don't need anything to come to Jesus. Just come. Just go to him. He's already waiting for you. He's not an airport. You just need to recognize, we just need to recognize our need for help, our need for salvation, that we are sinners, that we don't deserve anything, but we want to be friends with Jesus. And he is already waiting for you. He's ready to lift up your heart, your head, to say, to say to you, I love you. I do not condemn you. Be my friend. Go and sin no more. The one who says, I got you, my friend. I am with you always. That's the Jesus we believe in. That's why we come here every Sunday, to worship that Jesus of love, that Jesus who accepts you. How, how, just as you are. And he's waiting for you, my friends. He's calling you. Follow me. Be my disciple. And you don't need anything. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, how loving you are. How merciful. How great. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you, Lord, for always calling us. Thank you for forgiving all our sins, all our mistakes. Lord, if there are some mistakes that we've made in the past and we haven't been able to forgive ourselves, we haven't been able to forget about those mistakes, Lord, help us. We want to put all those mistakes on your hands. Take them away from us. Take that burden away from us. Help us to accept your forgiveness. Help us to accept your mercy, your grace. And Lord, thank you for calling us to be your disciples. Even when we do not deserve it. Even when we are sinners. Thank you for being our friend. Lord, help us to say yes. Help us to follow you, to encounter you, to know more about you. Lord, I pray that you will reveal yourself to all of us gathered here this morning. I pray that you will fill this church with your presence, with your love. That every family here, every person here will experience your love in a different way, in a new way that we haven't experienced before. Lord, I pray, fill Bexley United Methodist Church with your love. Fill our lives, our hearts with your love. We want to be your disciples. Thank you for accepting us. Thank you for inviting us. We love you, Jesus Christ. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen.
people of God, people of Bexley United Methodist Church, again, thank you for your generosity. Thank you, uh, those of you administrative board who approved supporting my stories and my seminar and my ministry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I am, I am truly grateful with this church. And now, leave this place to experience and to share the love of Jesus Christ. And may the love of God, the grace of Jesus, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you ever. Amen.